Hello everyone. So welcome to Sunya IS, and today we are starting with the GS2 mains crash course. And first we'll be dealing with Indian polity, and later on we'll be dealing with the subjects like governance, IR, etc. ठीक है जी. So in this first lecture we'll be starting with the first syllabus of our topic. We'll be covering the static aspects first. And static maybe wherever we can maintain the linkage with respect to the current we'll be doing, and later on we'll be dealing with all the current affairs or the contemporary affairs to be very precise from the past two two and a half years. ठीक है. So, if we talk about the roadmap of the class, so in this class, our first topic is going to be analyzing the legacy of British rule. Analyzing the legacy of British rule. That whether. <clears throat> after independence we are continuing with the british policies whichever the britishers were applying in india or is there any change we'll be clubbing this concept into the political things or the political aspects wherever we are continuing the economical aspects the international relation or the diplomatic aspects or the foreign policy aspects to be precise moving on to the societal aspects and the education policy and all so we'll be discussing all these concepts here second aspect of this class is going to be we'll be testing the representativeness of constituent assembly so there is a famous debate that whether the constituent assembly which made the constitution for the people of india was truly representative of the people of india or not second aspect of this debate or the uh, second way in which the question could be asked from this topic is that testing or critically analyzing the legitimacy of the constituent assembly or you can put here the second word legitimacy of constituent assembly because there has been various debates like the constituent assembly was one party dominant congress was the only party but on the other hand we will be <coughs> countering this argument by saying that at that point of time congress was india and india was congress sir and moreover after the first elections when the people who were there in the constituent assembly when the first elections happened in the year 1951 the people who returned back after getting the popular uh, majority or the popular support they were kind of same as the people who were present in the constituent assembly itself so there will be dealing all these aspects hana the third debate we are going to see is with respect to this uh, keyword called as is indian constitution a patchwork or not sir so basically if we talk about this debate this debate has its origin when b r ambedkar used this word that indian constitution has been made after ransacking all the known constitutions of the world some critics picked out this word and said that here the ransacking just means the a rug has been created and that rug has been created with just a patchwork or in other words to say that they say that indian constitution is nothing but just a bag of borrowings from where we have borrowed all the available concepts which were there in the other constitutions of the world but the view which is supporting dr b r ambedkar statement says that it is nothing wrong in borrowing wisdom from others if it is to serve the interests of our own people and even if it was a patchwork it was a beautiful patchwork right or in other words if i have to explain you for an example you make your notes for upsc let's talk about any subject the main criteria is that or the ideal way of doing that is that you select one source as your primary source you have your notes and then you value add from all the available sources to get knack of what your competitor is doing right this is the practice and this is what happened in uh, in the case of indian constitution as well so we'll be proving that <coughs> how that ransacking was good right and right the debate or why constitution is called as a bag of borrowings why the constitution was called as bag of borrowings moving on to the third or the last sorry fourth debate or the last debate of this class we'll be talking about the preamble preamble of the indian constitution we'll be discussing that whether if we whether when the indian constitution was made the preamble was attached if preamble was not attached 
whether it would have affected the status of the constitution or even today when we have the preamble in future if we remove it whether it will impact any status of the constitution or not second part of our debate will lie to the three important concepts first that is preamble a part of the constitution or not and here we will be referring to various supreme court cases second debate again we will take the help of supreme court cases in proving that that is preamble amendable or not theek hai is it part or not is it amendable or not and the last aspect we will be dealing with respect to the debates of preamble is that does preamble help in the aid or does preamble aid in interpreting the constitution or not theek hai so basically it is said that whenever there are two conflicting provisions mention the keyword provisions theek hai so whenever there will be two conflicting provisions given in the constitution of india the judiciary can take a help to interpret those provisions from the preamble so to what extent this is right and we'll be quoting various supreme court judgments here and then in the last or the final portion of this chapter will be because upsc already in 2017 i guess or 2018 has already asked this question discuss the adjectives attached to the word republic and if this has been asked so it becomes our duty to refer to other aspects as well and hence we will be discussing the two important aspects with respect to preamble in this class next uh, other aspects will be dealt in next class this class will be referring to the concept of that is india a socialist country or not the justification of word socialist given in preamble and i'll give you the reason why this becomes important because what happened this uh, for an example last year pm gati shakti right or gati shakti was asked in the gs paper 2 and hence going by this logic we have an introduction of this scheme called as pm kisan if you people know and pm kisan basically if we talk about represent the socialist nature of india so we go back to the history this debate with respect to that only the 42nd amendment 1976 made the word socialist explicit before that it was even implicit and the second debate which 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 is attached to the word socialist is that after the introduction of 1991 reforms the socialist nature of india has been questioned and the people who are supportive of this view used to quote the oxfam report which represents that only the top 1% of the indians are carrying 70% of the wealth which is just an example of inequality which is the feature of liberalism and that of capitalism which goes against the nature of socialist state like india but if we talk in 2020 or 2021 we have an introduction of the scheme called as pm kisan and in pm kisan <clears throat> what happens of for those who are not aware वैसे if you are clearing the prelim so you will be well aware of the scheme so government is giving around 2000 rupees every 4 months to the farmers Now the question is, from where does the government is getting this money? The government is obviously getting this money by taxing the richer section of the India, and this is this getting money or by taxing the economically, comparatively economically well of people, and giving them to the farmers is nothing but just the distribution of wealth which is given under Article Thirty Nine of the Directive Principles of State Policy, and hence on the basis of this PM Kisan, the question could be framed in the sense that justify the socialist nature of India. so we'll be discussing in which ways india is not a socialist and in which ways we are talking that india will be a socialist citing the example of pm kisan chalo second aspect we'll be dealing with is the justification of this word sovereign is the justification of this word sovereign when we uh, this 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 keyword becomes important or when we talk about this keyword we have to context with respect to the question or we can predict the question based on the basis of two uh, two contexts sir first context was the pakistan minister when he visited recently on this g20 summit in goa he made a statement with respect to kashmir and to counter his statement our foreign minister dr s jay shankar made a clear stance that you should wake up and have a coffee but because kashmir is a internal matter of india and you do not have any right to speak on the issue of kashmir and time and again this this our foreign minister after so there is this document of analysis of the 
foreign policy of india by dr jay shankar and in this and that he has uh, clubbed the foreign policy of india into six phases in six phases there is repetitive <coughs> a uh, repeated uh, mention of the word that india is a sovereign nation and the foreign powers do not have any right to comment in the internal matters of india so that can be a context to this question or the another beautiful context on this question is that recently in 2019 what happened or 2020 in the beginning of 2020 or ending of 2019 so there was this case with respect to this uh, ca or to be very precise the nrc basically in that the international human rights commission wanted to become an amicus curiae so amicus curiae is when you are not a party to that case but still you want to advocate for someone so international human rights commission wanted to become amicus curiae in this uh, <coughs> nrc case but for your surprise the stance of indian government was very clear and it said that international human rights commission this is nrc is an internal matter of india and you will not be allowed to become amicus curiae to this case and that was nothing but the exercising of sovereignty right and the people who believe in the opposite school and they believe that india is losing its sovereignty that's because of the uh, introduction of this globalization after 1991 they believe that after globalization the world has been interconnected and all and hence the decisions of india are to be based in line or in tone with the international community but then we have various examples where india is leading uh in the international forums we have example of international solar alliance we have example of hoso walk we have also example that when india is not going in line with the so called superpowers or the developed nations for an example usa didn't want us to go for s400 deal but not caring with respect to the sanctions which 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 might have been imposed by us we went for s400 deal and that was nothing but exercising of sovereignty okay so all those aspects these two keywords we'll be dealing in this class and right here case foreign minister's statement and second is the amicus curiae case with respect to the nrc judgment theek hai ji chalo now on this note let's begin with our first topic and that is your legacy of british rule is it continuing or is there a change or is there a change so this will be the first topic of our discussion today to understand <coughs> basically one more thing before we begin with the crash course as i have told you in the orientation class as well so there should be two lines of preparation one you should be preparing the interconnectedness in this very topic only for an example in this topic we will be understanding the context that in which context this debate arose what are the examples in political aspects where we are saying that still the british legacy is being continued or let me give you another example let's say we are doing constitutionalism which will be the topic of our next class and we'll be relating the concept of constitutionalism with two concepts that's the concept of constitutional morality as well as rule of law now you have to make in your mind this link between constitutional ism constitutional morality and rule of law if the question comes in connecting all these three so your the link in, should be there in your mind but on the same hand what is a constitutionalism in silos should also be there in your mind why because it is to say that we can uh, predict the exact questions in today's time it would be a very wrong thing to do that not ethically correct okay we can predict this can be there but not 110% the question would be asked in this manner only that would be really unjustified on my part to do with you guys so what we'll be doing is we'll be doing the concept of constitutionalism relating it to constitutional morality and rule of law in the same question but there i want you to be ready with the individual concept of constitutionalism you should be understanding the meaning cramming the definition what you have to write and you should be able to relate the constitutionalism concept with fundamental rights if the question comes constitutionalism how it is related with limiting the government 
and all then you should be ready with these three concepts constitutionalism constitutional morality and rule of law in silos as well theek hai ji chalo let's proceed now so if we talk about the legacy of the british rule uh, <clears throat> the context is the context can be clubbed into two one is the historical context from where theoretically this debate arose and second is the current aspect or i would say contemporary aspect so let's first talk about the current aspect in current aspect what is happening is still in india if we talk about the political aspect the bureaucracy which is there it is still carrying the cloak of secrecy with it we still have the official secrets act we still have the sedition law in india right all these things makes one think that we are still continuing the british legacy in india but on the same side if we talk that we are changing we also have the another side where the government has introduced the right to information act to remove that clock of secrecy and some states even in india are moving one step further than rti the states like rajasthan even have the jan suchna portal and that is nothing but moving away from the legacy of the british rule also till recently till 2017 18 we were still having the laws which were nothing but a continuity of the victorian mentality for an example the section 377 of ipc 1860 has just been recently struck down by supreme court so till 2018 just after so many years of independence we were continuing with the legacy but on the similar side with the recent intervention of judiciary we can make a point that yes we have made a change so this is the current context of this if we talk about the historical context sir so historical context goes like this so there was this historian called by the name of bipin chandra so to make you understand he started this debate that there are basically two kinds of countries one are the countries like china sir and other are the countries he gave an example of india he says the countries like china they began from a clean slate and hence such countries are not carrying forward any legacy they have all the new rules for themselves and the reason he says this that because what preceded independence in china was a communist revolution there was a complete absorb of power and when china got independent it began completely with the new slate formulating all the new new laws for itself and the reason behind it cites is communist revolution second is your india in india there was no revolution which preceded the independence there was a relative we studied in foundation the difference between uh, coming absorbing with the revolution which was the marxist style and then the fabian socialism in which we are gradually and peacefully doing it right so in india what happened was a transfer of power a transfer of power which was a relatively peaceful though with exception of rights etc but relatively peaceful than this revolution and a gradual process and a gradual process so what happened in this gradual process when the power was being transferred in bits and pieces and finally it was transferred completely with the day on which we got independence or with the mount batten plan when it was finally passed in the month of june right so what happened during that time there was a peaceful and relative uh, gradually uh, transfer of power in which the power was to be transferred to whom to the indian elites and here you need to know that these indian elites are the ones which got their education in the way and in which was the way that was your western liberal education and hence they were well aware of this fact that if the britishers are transferring us the power and we will be in the power and if the britisher pol british policies will remain same who will be the beneficial class they will be thus so indian elites knowing the british policies hence try to continue the legacy of british so that they can remain hegemon 
ठीक है सो दे कैन गेट ऑल द पावर दैट इज द हिस्टोरिकल कंटेक्स दैट वाई वी क्वेश्चन द लेगेसी ऑफ द ब्रिटिश because indian elites know british policies and they knew that if we continue even they, this after independence we will be the one who will be taking the place of britishers and hence they continued it and also with whatever education they have whichever mindset they have they were in the favor of this western liberal democratic order and which was nothing but famous for its suppressive policies right capitalism always is attached with suppressing the or having inequalities in the class and that is what has been continued that's why this deb debate arises theek hai now let's see that whether actually we are continuing the legacy of the british or not and then we'll be concluding that what is more continuity is more or change is more and then we'll be quoting ramendranath tagore here on what he has to say between uh, uh, on this debate of legacy theek hai ji chalo let's first discuss the political aspects sir and for your uh, for your uh, knowledge if the question comes do not start with this historical context this historical context was just to let you know right you should start with the current context citing any they say we'll be doing four or five points in political aspects two or three points in economy one or two points in foreign policy etc so out of anything since it is a question of gs2 i would prefer that you should choose two examples from political aspects which are to be your context for example the legacy of the british rule take one from the negative side where we are citing that there is no change and take one from this side show the contradiction and the basis of this debate that can be a beautiful introduction theek hai ji this is your positive side and uh, we are saying that it has there has been a change now let's talk about the first political aspect and that is your government of india act 1935 now you all know that the government of india act whenever we study it in the field of history we always say that this was the act whose objective was to maintain the hold of raj on india theek okay, hai this was the main objective of this act now if we talk about the main provisions of the indian constitution for an example let's talk about the federal nature of india let's talk about the ordinance power let's talk about the emergency provisions all those have been taken from where those have been taken from government of india act only so we're taking the provisions from the act by not seeing what was the objective of this act objective was to maintain the hold of raj and hence we are still incorporating the provisions that becomes your first point of criticism also if we link it backward to the history this was the act which was based on the recommendations of simon commission which was based on the recommendations of simon commission and you know what sort of protests indian does or indians did with respect to the simon commission famous freedom fighter lala lajpat rai died while protesting against the simon commission now the simon commission against whose protest our freedom fighters died on this uh, this commission's recommendations in which no indians were involved you have to keep this in mind on this commission's recommendations this act was made and the objective was not to uh, to maintain the hold of raj and you are taking the provisions from this act to make constitution of india this has to be your first criticism sir here we are saying that still the provisions which were mentioned in there are continuing in india and hence we say that the british legacy is being followed theek hai ji second thing if we talk about just after one year of independence we have an introduction of preventive detention law and it is still being continued now why we are objecting against this because what happened the main person who was there behind the introduction of this preventive detention law was mr jawaharlal nehru and for your surprise the origin of this case which you people have studied the ak gopalan so who was ak gopalan ak gopalan was a leader and a communist leader and he was a political opponent of jawaharlal nehru who was the person 
हु सेड दैट इन प्रियम्बल यू हैव रिटन वन ऑफ द आइडियल्स विल बी अ लिबरल सोसाइटी एंड डज दिस प्रिवेंटिव डेंशन लॉ इज एंड इट गोइंग अगेंस्ट लिबरलिज्म सो दैट वॉज द बेसिस ऑफ योर एके गोपालन जजमेंट right so just after one year you are introducing preventive detention laws which were nothing but the continuing the legacy of the britishers in india and for your surprise this nehru was the same person who promised that just after independence there will be no black laws in india now you understanding why the why it is blamed that the indian elite class understood that whatever britishers were following on if we follow them our hegemony will remain and one of the examples could be cited for this is this the third example you can quote here is with respect to the indian bureaucracy and note down the keyword which you have to highlight that india it is still having a clock of secrecy it is still having the clock of secrecy and also you can cite here one committee that is your alag committee you can cite here alag committee and alag committee clearly said that still the indian bureaucracy still the indian bureaucracy is possessing the colonial mindset theek hai ji so this can be another point where we are continuing the legacy then without any hesitation you can mention the continuation of the official secrets act and lastly in the political aspect you can mention the continuation of the sedition law so this is your political aspect sir now here we have shown sir there is a negativity or the negative aspects where we are continuing with the legacy of the britishers now do we have any points to support our view that we are not continuing the first point to support is the introduction of rti which is nothing but countering the cloak of secrecy which the bureaucracy used to possess you can file an rti application and get the information of whatever is happening and this actually proves that we are moving on away from the british legacy in this the people we the people of india who have instilled the government are having complete rights to know what is happening then you can move ahead one step ahead that is your jan suchna portal of rajasthan government where now we have moved on from this process there is no need of filing an application also we have made the duty of the government departments that on their website they should be mentioning everything which the which the people of india requires theek hai ji then let's move on to the third aspect thirdly you can also mention that recently you can mention the case navtej singh johar judgment navtej singh johar judgment in which what in this what happened in this supreme court said that section 377 of ipc 1860 is now declared null and void it struck down the section 377 of ipc 1860 right so basically it decriminalized it, it decriminalized section 377 and decriminalizing section 377 is nothing but moving away of india from the victorian era mentality so these can be your points to negate that yes india is changing sir is india india is changing in the political aspect clear sir now let's move on to the next aspect and that is your economic aspect
Now, if we talk about the economic aspect, the first point to say that we are continuing with the legacy is that still in majority of the areas of our economy, even post independence, India is a supplier of raw material. India is a supplier of raw materials. And instead, we are also becoming the market for the Western goods to inflow in India. Right? So that British legacy, in, according to which the drain of wealth theory was related, it is still being continued in India. So first ex uh, justification is that even post-independent India, India in various sectors has become a supplier of raw materials. and an importer of western finished goods so this can be your first point to answer this then even in the level of international economy when we talk about the international economy the countries like india are still carrying the colonial legacy and how is that because there is a keyword which is called as semi peripheral countries. Semi peripheral countries, and India is classified into semi peripheral countries. Other examples can be of Mexico, Brazil, etc. They all, along with India, they are categorized into semi peripheral states. Now, what is the meaning of the semi peripheral states? So, what happens basically, let's say if this is a circle, okay. In this core of the circle lies the developed Western countries. Which were the colonial powers also sometime. And this is the periphery. On this periphery lies the poor African nations. Or to be very precise, the third world countries. And then somewhere in the middle, the semi-peripheral countries lies the countries like India, which were before the colonies, but now they are in the middle stage, not on the periphery. And for information, this is a derogatory term. This is not something that from periphery we are improving. India was India in the back was known as a golden sparrow. Our GDP during the time of Mughals was huge. From that we are deteriorating from core. We have moved to the semi peripheral areas. And still India is one of them. Still India is clubbed into semi-peripheral state. Okay. Then <coughs> the next point can be the regional imbalance. If we talk about the regional imbalance, so during the time of Britishers, they had almost three or four main centers. You can name Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, etc. And rest of the India was not developed at all. So there was a sort of regional imbalance, which is still continuing now. The states like Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, which are the resource rich states, they still remain to be poor. And even right now, we have very few centers of development. For an example, we have a center of Mumbai. That is again continuation of the British legacy. We have a center of Madras or Bangalore. One center, we have center of Delhi and the Calcutta. Rest hinterland or the rest states from where we are extracting the resources, they still remain poor, sir. This is nothing but a gain. And also for here, you note down the stats. The top three states, the top three states have three times, have three times the GDP per capita GDP per capita, the top three rich states are the top three states. Then the bottom three states. Then the bottommost three states. Okay, so this is again start to prove that regional imbalance is continuing. Right? And this regional imbalance has led to the things like rural poverty. Okay? Rural backwardness. La uh, no, you cannot say no, but because lack of investment in agriculture and agriculture infrastructure. And with the exception of service sector, all the sections are all the sectors are deteriorating. Right. So this was same 
in the british era as well so there has been no change we still say that the india's legacy british legacy is being continued then let's move on to this aspect that where we feel that this legacy is not continuing so the first point of justification is now the indian government is moving away and we don't want to become just a supplier we want the manufacturing sector to dwell in india and for that indian government has come up with the scheme like make in india also with the help of these agriculture and manufacturing sectors the indian government is now targeting to become a 5 trillion dollar economy sorry they how it will go away ha chalo 5 trillion dollar economy this is nothing but moving away from becoming a supplier now on the basis of agriculture because one of the strong criticism of saying that india will not be able to become a 5 trillion dollar economy we say that agriculture has to double and for that we have also various initiatives like doubling the farmers income that also you can quote here this means that even we have not achieved results but at least we are willing uh, willing to move away from the legacy which was given to us by britishers we are taking certain steps towards that again here you can quote pm kisan in british times when the farmers were getting exploited from that now the government is paying the farmers fulfilling the principles under directive principles of state policy that is nothing but the distribution of wealth right so these points can be uh, things then <clears throat> the main focus during the time of britishers was to deprive indian people but the present day government is also coming up with the economic empowerment of the people for an example we have your jam trinity in which we are trying to plug the economic loopholes which were being created by the uh, by the bureaucracy right in 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 one of the reports it said that if one rupee was being sent by the government of india only around 10 to 15 paisa would reach the final uh, target which the government was targeting and from now from that era we have now what we have jam trinity in which the money is directly getting uh, getting uh, credited to the bank account of the person also moving away from that you can also quote here the e rupee concept a beautiful concept in which the government is also now along with the economic aspects are able to are or are, are tackling the societal aspects also it might happen that the government is willing to improve the economic conditions but during uh, due to certain family elements due to certain social elements again the money would reach the family but not be targeted where the government intended it to and hence the introduction of e rupee has also been a very good development with respect to the economic empowerment and that is a beautiful example of moving away from the british legacy clear sir so these can be your economic arguments then sir let's move and let's uh, next discuss the societal aspects chalo so the first thing in the societal aspect you can mention <clears throat> we have from the british legacy is still continuing is the policy of divide and rule second aspect can be your social conflicts third aspect can be your politics 
on the basis of religion theek hai still considered in even in the 21st century we are considering the things which were not exact or right with respect to the victorian mentality we are still considering them wrong right for an example still homosexuality is considered to be a taboo adultery till recently was also considered a taboo this is all but nothing but the continuing continuation of the british legacy also if you talk about this the social conflicts or the policy of divide and rule in the in the time of britishers the formation of all india muslim league in the year 1906 and lord minto was instrumental in that and till still today even we today we have example of various rights recently in 2020 we have example of northeast delhi rights that is nothing but the politics on the basis of religion right so all these example you can quote you can write northeast delhi rights another example if you want to extend this if this question comes on essay you can also write still in india there is no intermixing of the populations on the basis of religion and when i say intermixing it's like you will find that whenever you go to a particular city you always have an area that this is a muslim dominated area the hindu policemen cannot enter hindu dominated area muslim policemen cannot enter still you have pockets of population of minorities residing somewhere in the city so this is nothing but the continuation of the legacy of the british rule right then <clears throat> if we talk about the societal aspects right so you can quote here i'll i'll name right recently the bench of km joseph so these are the judges of supreme court this is a recent on 29th of march 2023 so the bench of justice km joseph and bv nagarath bv nagarath they said that they said that people of india and especially the politicians they should take a oath to not vilify vilify means to instigate vilify the different people belonging to different communities religion etc they should not vilify the people on the basis of religion community etc they should take the oath to do so and this is nothing indian judiciary is letting india to move away from the british legacy because this was one of the core policies of the british and here again the question if specifically comes with respect to the societal aspects so you can quote here decriminalizing homosexuality section 377 of ipc 1860 in navteej singh johar case another can be this decriminalizing of adultery and to be very precise uh, it was section 497 497 so do not write to be very precise decriminalizing it right changing the approach towards adultery under section 497 right under section 497 now let's move to the next aspect and that is the level of your foreign policy let's talk about the foreign policy aspect so the critics which say that we are still continuing with the british legacy they say that the out products of uh, india getting independent or the out products of this thing called as partition right which was the 
which was nothing but one of the British policies, we are still not able to do away with it. The legacy of partition is still continuing, sir. So the first thing where we are continuing is the legacy of partition itself. Still India is not in good terms with the country called Pakistan. The first example could be quoted with this. Second point can be that due to Britishers or whatever policies Britishers used to have in especially the South Asia. So South Asia is least integrated and is only second to Middle East in this context. Right, that is nothing but again the continuation of what British rule. Right, so this is again what 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 Britishers wanted to do the divide and rule policy, and. To this extent, we can also say that the South Asian uh, disintegration or the non-availability of peace and harmony in this region has also brought this region to the brink, brink of this nuclear war. Right, Time and again, India and Pakistan gave threats to each other for the, though it will not happen, but still we are on the brink of nuclear war to just write a point, you can quote it here. Right. Then lastly, some critiques are also of the opinion that India signing treaties etc. with the smaller nations within its neighborhood, like for an example we have treaties with Nepal, we have treaties with Bhutan and all. This is nothing but replication of the British ways. This is nothing but whatever is called as Nehru's treaty diplomacy is nothing but a simple modification of what Curzon was doing and hence the idea of what India wanted to become a big brother in the region this treaty diplomacy of India is making the other small nations insecure right so this treaty diplomacy point can be quoted here which is making the smaller neighbors insecure and it is not nothing but a simple modification of Curzon's policies. So these all points can be there in the foreign policy where we are continuing the British legacy. Then is there any change? Yes, there is a clear change with respect to it. The first point you can quote here is the soft vaccine diplomacy where India even in the time of a dire need when India itself wanted it it served the interests of others as well and this is called a soft vaccine diplomacy during the time of COVID we sent vaccines to the other nations and thereby we were trying to project our image as a big brother right second point you can quote here is that uh, so there is this depo uh, the assessment right this report the assessment of India's foreign policy by Dr. S. Jayashankar or you can simply quote by the finance minister of India in which he has divided the foreign policy of India into six phases to be very precise. And the sixth phase starts from 2013 and he says that this is the phase of the keywords are energetic diplomacy. Energetic diplomacy. And in this energetic diplomacy what India has done? India has clearly projected its stance as a sovereign nation. With other nations having no right to influence its decisions in the internal matters as well as the external matters of India. Secondly, India following or India lying or being a colonial uh, subject right of the Britishers. Now we are projecting or leading at the international forums and you can write the example of International Solar Alliance 
and you can uh, or quote the example of Osovog. Then again, the projection of sovereignty, the example of S400 deal can be quoted. Not caring with respect to the sanctions of United States of America is nothing but energetic diplomacy. Right? Then the very beautiful example of India's expanding clout and change with respect to the foreign policy is that we were the subjects of Britishers, right, before independence. But now, what happened? A beautiful example could be given of the elections for ICJ. So in ICJ elections, what happens? There were basically two candidates who were standing for the uh, of standing for this. One was India, and one and another was of UK. So for your surprise, before the elections happen, the UK's candidate he withdrew his name, and India got elected to ICJ. So that is nothing but an example of energetic diplomatic policy, or or the clout India is now having at the international level. Clear. So then you can say that uh, also if we talk about the environmental aspect okay so this common but differentiated responsibilities that the developed nations have already exploited and hence they have more responsibilities than the developing nations who in the past have done nothing to the environment relatively so India was at the forefront of this common but differentiated responsibilities and it has been successful to get it inculcated in the Paris Agreement. So that is all nothing but a change from the foreign policy which was being followed by the Britishers. So that is again an example of change in the legacy. Last aspect is your educational aspect sir. Last aspect is your educational aspect. Chalo. So where are we following the legacy? So till recently what we were doing or the intentions of Britishers were to produce clocks out of Indians. Hence they focused on rote learning, which is still a tradition in India. They did not want Indians to be creative. Creativity element was missing. Right. And also, till recently, we are still following Macaulay's education policy. Or Lord Macaulay's education policy. Right, so Malcoli's education system is still being continued in India. That is where we say still we are following the British legacy. But what happened post independence, or you can start with a recent example of new education policy of 2020. So, new education policy 2020 is a classic example of moving away from the British legacy. Right. So here the focus is of multidisciplinary approach. The focus is on creativity or learning via creativity, learning via exercise, not rote learning. Right. You can also quote here the another example and that is uh, we have also the formation of All India Council for Technical Education and here we are uh, combining the education with the skill development. So not that only the rote learning should be become the part of the Indian's education but also some sort of skill development should happen. Okay, for that we have All India Council for Technical Education that is supporting that. Then we also in new under new education policy, we have also a departure from silos mentality. The keywords are departure from silos mentality. This you can quote here. What do you mean by departure from silos mentality? This means that in our times also when uh, I, I quoted that till recently we were following the Lord Macaulay's policy in education. So if some student opted for humanities, he was not allowed to study the subjects of science. 
if someone has studied science or has opted science in his grade 11th and 12th he was not allowed to opt for humanities now this there has been a departure under new education policy from the silos mentality you can opt any combination theek if you are a humanities student you can opt a subject from sciences if you are sciences you can opt a subject from commerce and all hence this will this is a departure or a clear example of saying that we have moved away from the british legacy sir clear chalo then let's move on the conclusion so what are we concluding now or what can be the beautiful conclusion to this rabindranath tagore said a beautiful statement with respect to this we want to conclude this question with that he said that i'm sure that britishers will leave india one day however before leaving they will leave enough dirt and filth that generations of indians will not be able to clean it right so before concluding set the tone that yes we accept there is more of a continuity and less of change and hence rabindranath tagore was right when he said that i'm sure britishers will leave india one day but or however i am sure before they leave they will leave enough dirt and filth behind that generations of india will not be able to clean it one can be this thing theek hai another can be a ending which is a sort of a way forward thing and for this way forward you need to understand or you need to now have the historical context we did historical context we did no so under historical context we said india may there was a transfer of power china may independence was preceded by what by preceded by a communist revolution but according to pratap bhanu mehta you can quote it or if you don't want to quote in gs that's fine but even if you quote there is no problem in that so according to pratap bhanu mehta revolution though preceded in those countries and they began from a clean slate but in india what happened was a gradual transfer of power and we have a constitution we made a constitution and we believed that this constitution will bring a revolution we brought a constitution and we wanted or we were sure that the revolution will be brought in india via this constitution revolution did not preceded the formation of a constitution constitution came and we entrusted the responsibility of bringing the revolution in this constitution and hence if we want to bring a revolution a change from the british legacy the constitutional aspects like constitutional ism constitutional morality should be followed should be followed and if on this note you want to write something conclusionary on this argument so you can write that the trust which we instilled in the constitution of bringing a revolution it has been successful to a lot of extent because constitution of india has been successful in converting the highly traditional society into a modern egalitarian one into a modern egalitarian one and imagine the times in 1950s when the people from two different caste it it might be prevalent in some parts of india right now but it is not the norm everywhere in 1950s 1960s the people from one caste would not even eat in the utensils of another class another class and now imagine your times have you ever asked your batchmate or the classmate with respect to what is your caste religion etc no people nowadays have a tendency to advocate their voice for the weaker classes so yes our constitution has been successful it has the 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 revolutionary document which we thought it would be it has been successful to some extent and it has converted the highly traditional society into a modern and egalitarian one egalitarian one clear sir so this would be the this was your first topic now let's move on to the second topic and that is your 
testing with respect to the representativeness of the constituent assembly or let's say that uh, let's critically analyze the legitimacy of the constituent assembly and before doing that let's first explore what are the ways in which upsc can frame a question on this aspect okay the first question can be sorry was constitution a consensus document or what is the legitimacy of constituent assembly or was constituent assembly true representative of indians ठीक है जी सो दीज आर द वेज इन विच दिस क्वेश्चन कैन बी आस्ट इन द रियल एग्जामिनेशन नो लेट्स प्रोसीड विद दिस सो वॉट हैपन्स इज इफ यू टॉक अबाउट द डिबेट सो इट इज सेड दैट द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया विच वॉज द बाय प्रोडक्ट ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूंट असेंबली it was neither formed in accordance with the will of the indian people and second is neither did it represented the views of all the sections of the society theek okay? hai so two things neither it represented the will of the people and nor it represented the interests of all sections of society now the reason is or let us first see that what is the reason behind saying these two statements why the first reason you can quote with respect to this or the first reason behind is that the constitution is called as a congress document sir it is called as a congress document because the party which was dominating the constituent assembly it is also called that it was a one party assembly and that's why it is criticized that only the views or the interests of the congress that is one party is represented in the congress in the constitution second argument is that or it can be derived from here only it is also criticized as your one party assembly right third argument is that you can quote here the churchill called it assembly of brahmins and the reason behind this is that if we look at the composition of the constituent assembly on the basis of religion or caste or let's specifically about caste so 80% of the people in the constituent assembly they belonged to upper caste to be very precise 80% of the people in the constituent assembly they belonged to upper caste and out of these 80% also 25% were brahmins and hence the this school which believes in this ideology says that how can you expect a constituent assembly which was having a percentage of 80% of the upper caste people would represented or would have inculcated the provisions with respect to the lower caste people 
right so this is one another aspect next aspect is that if we talk about the composition so the members of your constituent assembly they were indirectly elected and how they were indirectly elected they were elected by the members of provincial legislatures and now here you need to you can easily say that the members of provincial legislature were also elected by the people of india they represented the will of the people of india ha na but these and and on the similar hand these are the people who are electing constituent assembly people and there is nothing wrong but there you need to go back to the history right so what happened was these people who were the representatives at the provincial legislature level they were themselves elected on the basis of limited franchise so what happens these members of provincial legislature which were elected the which were electing the members of constituent assembly they were themselves elected on the basis of limited franchise and this limited franchise means that there were certain qualifications and there were sorry three qualifications to be very precise tax property and education if someone was qualifying on these three criteria that was the only person who was eligible to vote for the members of provincial legislature and then provincial legislature assembly members were electing the members of constituent assembly and hence we say that it is not a true representative and if we talk about exactly in the number terms so in accordance with these three criteria only 5% of the indians did vote at that point of time or were eligible to vote at that point of time and hence it is said that the constituent assembly was not uh, not properly elected or not uh, re truly representing the indian people theek hai ji then another criticism is that it also had a nominated member from princely states from princely states that's the another argument you can uh, you can quote sir and lastly the school which believes in all these points also says that that our argument is correct and we have a very solid basis to prove that and the solid basis is that the chief draftsman of the constitution that was dr b r ambedkar was the first person or who was the head of the uh, drafting committee he was the first person to burn the copy of the indian constitution after it was made ठीक है जी सो दीज आर द आर्ग्यूमेंट्स बाय द वर्च्यू ऑफ व्हाट व्हिच दे वर टेलिंग दीज पॉइंट्स बट नाउ लॉजिकली यू शुड थिंक दैट व्हाट मेड द पीपल हु बिलोंग टू दिस स्कूल ऑफ आर्ग्यूमेंट से दिस व्हाई डिड दे थिंक इन दिस वे ऐसा सोचा ही क्यों एंड द मेजर रीजन आर द टू रीजंस बिहाइंड व्हाई दे थॉट लाइक दिस लेट अस डिस्कस दैट सो द टू मेजर रीजंस were first reason is based on gandhi ji and second reason is based on the views of congress working committee so gandhi ji in 1922 clearly said that the constitution of india or swaraj to be very precise what was the term used at that point of time that swaraj will not be a free gift of britishers free gift of britishers this means that they will not have any influence at the point of time we will be making a constitution while we will be self ruling ourselves that is the meaning of swaraj but the constitution will only be an expression of indians expression of indians only these were the lines he said in 1922 second came the argument of congress working committee which is said in 1934 it said that the constituent assembly which will be specifically formed to make the constitution of india will be elected on the basis of universal adult franchise will be elected on the uni uh, basis of universal adult franchise 
सो दीज वर द टू आर्ग्यूमेंट विच वर इन द माइंड ऑफ द पीपल who advocated that these things have not been done sir instead what has happened these are the reasons and hence they questioned the credibility of the constituent assembly now this happened this is their argument why they are thinking like this because of these two reasons and then they cite what actually happened these were the reasons why that happened and now let's see what actually happened which aggrieved them now if we see practically what happened or the practical practically what happened now so if we say that practically what happened with respect to the constituent assembly so we have to clearly accept this fact that constituent assembly was the gift of britishers sir constituent assembly was the gift of britishers the demand was finally accepted in the august offer of 1940 and then finally the composition whoever will be elected how they will be elected how they will be coming was entirely done in accordance with the cabinet mission plan cabinet mission plan of 1946 which was exactly in opposite to these two ideas this is your first argument the second argument we can propose is that we are saying that that has to be elected on the basis of universal adult franchise will not be the product of britishers and it will be expression of indians and when we say that it will be expression of indians does making constituent assembly on the basis of cabinet mission plan justifies this idea the answer will be clear no and the reason being this cabinet mission plan was nothing but a product which was passed by the british parliament itself it was passed by the british parliament itself theek hai ji chalo then next thing is again the members countering the view which congress working committee gave did gave in 1934 the members were indirectly elected and you know how here again you can quote the stats theek hai these are the two dimensions in which this question can be addressed again what happened this again engraved them that from princely states you are nominating the people and from the british uh, or the provincial legislature you are just opting the people but the people who are selecting the members of constituent assembly are themselves elected on limited franchise that is of tax property and education and in total while electing the members of provincial legislature only 5% of the indians did vote hence again rose the question theek hai ji so all these aspects practically this happened in graved indians now here to answer this question let's add certain factual elements also right and point number 1 right first meeting of the assembly 9th december 1946 first meeting this 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 aspect we are writing because when you will be addressing the answers the arguments you know now and to justify to your your those arguments you should not be opening chapters like making the constitution and remembering the date so we need just four five dates and data that will be a uh, date and aspects will be writing on here only right on second rajendra prasad dr rajendra prasad first president 11th december 1946 so how you have to remember this bas ek ye date yaad rakhna 9th december first meeting uska ek din break liye on 11th ek din chhod ke they decided their president then i done third point fir ek din ka break liya and then objectives resolution was given by pandit jawahar lal nehru on 13th of december 
1946. This was on 11th, 9th, 11th, 13th. Then, sir, Constitution got adopted on 26th of November, 1949. The next date, you know, 26th of January, 1950. Then, article which talks about the commencement of Constitution. Majority of you would have skipped these articles but noted down article 393 and 394 specifically talks about the commencement of the constitution. That which of the articles will be immediately enforced and which will be enforced from 26th of January 1950. Article 393 and 394 should be there in the introduction or should be there in the, uh, in the uh, body of your answer. Then lastly you should remember the total time taken and that was your two years, 11 months and eight days. Next, uh, drafting committee chairman, B.R. Ambedkar. Bas, that's it. This is the factual information. If you inculcate, you will, your answers will be enriching. Now, Let's talk about the arguments which support the view of this people. The people say that the Constituent Assembly was not true representative. They said that these are the things which happened. This was promised to us and practically these things happened. And they say even in the present time we can show you two supportive arguments which will support that it was not true representative sir. No it is not. Because it is yielding such results and two of that results are their main argument. Okay. The first is that till now since it did not carry the representation from all sections we have reached 105 amendments in case we would have taken the considerations from all the sections the frequent the frequent amendments would not have been required versus they give the argument the oldest written constitution of the world that is us have till now seen just a 27 amendments to be precise 26 or 27 yeah 27 amendments to be precise so this is their first logical argument by which they support second argument they support by uh, support their uh, view is that there have been various conflicts various conflicts which have arose for an example that do we have to follow right to equality or reservation second do we have to follow the right to freedom of religion or state should be getting involved to enforce ucc uniform civil code third argument is that that should we sponsor individual rights or group rights and the tussle's recent example you have with sabari mala judgment or the sabari mala case so these are their supportive arguments now let's move to the other side of the story and see the counter arguments by the virtue of which we can say that no sir whatever it was whatever you are saying it's fine but constituent assembly was a true representative of the Indians. Constituent assembly's formation was legitimate. Okay, so let's see. Put down the heading counter arguments. So, we started this debate from this topic that this constituent assembly neither represents the will of the people. Will of the people means what is written in the starting of the preamble, we the people of India. So it was not we the people of India, it was just 
a certain section of the society which came and they formed the constitution for all so it does not represent the will of the people theek hai chalo so the first argument to counter was itself given by the supreme court of india in the keshavanand bharati judgment in the keshavanand bharati judgment of 1973 and in the supreme court clearly said that that doubting this expression we the people of india or thus whether the constitution represent the will of the people is not to be questioned sir and there is no point in factually examining the keyword will of the people right so supreme court clearly said that our stance is that constituent assembly did represent it and there is no point in factually analyzing the keyword we the people of india or will of the people ठीक है जी सो दिस इज द फर्स्ट काउंटर आर्ग्यूमेंट वी विल आल्सो प्रोजेक्ट सेकंड इज इट आल्सो सेड दैट नो मोर क्वेश्चनिंग एंड वी हैव टू एक्सेप्ट इट करेक्ट एज इट इज और इसको हम ऐसा ही मानेंगे ठीक है सो राइट इट डाउन सुप्रीम कोर्ट इन केशवनंद भारती केस सेड देर इज नो पॉइंट इन एग्जामिनिंग द फैक्चुअल करेक्टनेस देर इज नो पॉइंट इन एग्जामिनिंग द फैक्चुअल करेक्टनेस ऑफ द वर्ड वी द पीपल we the people full stop we have to accept it as correct we have to accept it as correct then second argument can be given from the words of granville austin sir one of the constitutional experts especially in the indian constitution he says that if you people say that the constituent assembly was represented by only one party and that is your congress or there was one party dominance in the constituent assembly but at the same point you also need to be aware of this fact that at that point of time during the late 1940s or the 1950s at that point of time congress was india and india was congress sir and india was congress sir this is the second argument you can give third argument is that they say that congress was a single party dominance and how can one party represent the views of all parties right so they again clearly deny they also say that also you can support this argument that we accept that congress was a single party but congress also co-opted members from other parties and uh, hence what was the out product was nothing but a consensus document because despite being a single party it also co-opted the members from other parties so your point of saying that it was not representative nullifies here then the next argument is constitution is a consensus document why consensus document because though we say that the members came by indirect elections this and that dominated by the upper up, upper class brahmins were 25% upper class were 80% yet congress co opted the members and each and every provision which were inculcated in the constitution of india were after so many readings and after thorough deliberation done on each and every topic they decided a topic a thorough deliberation was done then that topic was voted upon by the constituent assembly and then that was inculcated in the final constitution hence our constitution is a consensus document and it represent the views of the people of india theek hai next argument is the testament after first elections here again that same very argument you can quote but we say that the people were indirectly elected they did not represented the will of the people people were nominated and all but majority of the people after 1951 elections got over when the results came they came back the same people majority of the same people came back with a popular mandate that itself verifies that the people who were even via indirect election sitting in the constituent assembly they represented the will of the people and people testified it in the first elections as well first general elections 
ठीक है सो दैट टेस्टमेंट आफ्टर फर्स्ट इलेक्शन और द फर्स्ट जनरल इलेक्शन यू कैन कोट हेयर दैट कैन बी गिवेन देन लास्टली इट इज सेड दैट another point to counter that congress it was one party dominance that what happened in late 1990s there was this national commission for the uh, this national commission for the review of the working of constitution ncrwc this was constituted by the parties other than the congress party for an example your nda alliance during that bihari vajpayee government and they also said that there is no need of revisiting the constitution they also said that right so it is a neutral opinion it is not that the congress after 50 years of independence they constitution uh, constituted this uh, national uh, commission for the uh, national commission for reviewing the working of constitution and that commission said no need of revisiting it was constituted by the other parties only still this neutral commission which was established by the another party government it said that there is no need of revisiting the government clear so these can be your points to counter that yes constituent assembly which made the constitution of india was a representative was a representative of the people of india and it has and it was or it it is or it was a legitimate constituent assembly theek hai ji chal now rahi baat aagi hamari last pe conclusion ki or conclusion or way forward again has to rotate on similar lines of pratap bhanu mehta you can again quote that pratap bhanu mehta who is a constitutional expert said that indian constitution was made by the constituent assembly to become a revolutionary document by via which the will of the people was expressed and the people wanted or the people believed that this constitution will bring a revolution which this constitution actually did and how it did by constitution being a revolutionary document and how did it bring a revolution by again converting the highly traditional society which believed in all the customs and traditions and this and that all the ill doings ha na by ill doings i mean all the superstitions the society believed in right to a modern egalitarian one so we will not be cramming the different conclusions for all theek hai we will not be entering into the specificities one conclusion will do for that legacy aspect also this conclusion will do for this aspect also clear sir chalo let's move to the next question and that is is indian constitution a bag of borrowings or is it a patchwork so this is the next question so in this question again whatever value addition points i gave you here By inculcating this in your introduction, you can perform a uh, you can form a beautiful introduction. ठीक है तो एक तो commencement वाला aspect लिख दीजिएगा, constituent assembly का aspect लिख दीजिएगा कि this is all how it has been formed and the keyword in your introduction should be वो aspect तो लिखने ही हैं. You should quote B R Ambedkar, who said that it was made after ransacking. all the available quest uh, sorry all the available not questions <laughs> constitutions of the world <laughs> chalo to isi baat se hi hamara debate shuru hota hai b r ambedkar ji said in a positive tone that we have extracted the best out of everything we have extracted the best out of everything for an example if we made up a constitution uh, the, the one criticism was had be uh, had been amended 105 times but sir there we need to look that our constitution has chosen the best out of all if at some point of time we uh, at some uh, uh, with respect to the some provisions we can amend the constitution with simple majority on the similar hand our constitution assembly people had this intellect and vision 
to inculcate the process of amending the constitution with special majority wherever it was needed so hence it was nothing but from us we took the process of special majority or if uk we took it simple majority and we ransacked both the constitution and our in our constitution we have a blend of rigidity and flexibility this is this is this also you can draw in the diagrammatic format in the question just after the introduction or if usa is federal and uk has some sort of a unitary system we again have a combination of both and this is what ransacking and this is what by ransacking b r ambedkar ji meant at that point of time right then again another diagram if you want to draw do not quote the sources here examiner doesn't want to we want you to quote the sources usko ye information nahi leni what we have taken from we are do not write a paragraph saying this only if you want to inculcate just draw a diagrammatic format that from usa we brought this from uk we brought parliamentary form of government from germany we brought this from australia we brought concurrent list this and that and the list goes on make it in a diagrammatic format that is your choice whatever you want to do then sir on this question that is constitution a bag of borrowings we have told the reason now to the examiner that why is it said because it was adopted from a lot of constitutions of the world and that you have shown in the diagrammatic format also theek hai or even if you want that after diagrammatic question you can write one or two points that this is the reason because of the above given figure number 1 indian constitution is called as a bag of borrowings but your first counter argument to this is that it is no wrong in borrowing wisdom from others and especially in this situation or in the situation in which this wisdom will be serving the interests of our own people second reason you can say that though we ransacked but yet each provision was adopted after thorough deliberation and consensus suiting it with the indian needs for an example if we if we adopted the parliamentary form of government we have clear differences with that of the government of uk parliamentary form of government being held in uk uk don't have the concept of fundamental rights but because but we inculcated to suit our needs from the us constitution one or two examples of such thought such sort you can write or if you have not drawn a diagram or let's say you have drawn the diagram of amendment take this example of federal and unitary we have a uh, amalgamation of both and that example you can write there or draw a diagram of unitary and federal here take this example and substantiate substantiate your this argument with this example that we have a blend of rigidity and flexibility and that was in accordance with the indian needs then you can quote a historical aspect that historically also indian culture has always been accommodative acceptive and tolerant we are doing this in since history whoever came to india we accepted them and hence if someone is having a good thing which can serve the interest of our people going with our historical thought or going with our historical ideology of being accommodative and acceptive we are accepting the ideas and it is no wrong and then finally if we talk about the conclusive argument you can again quote gandhi ji here or again that revolutionary document that whatever we did even if we ransacked the revolution which we believed that our constitution will bring it has to some extent been successful how again that same argument converting a highly traditional society into a modern egalitarian one 
or gandhi ji's quote can do if you want to write in a philosophical way so gandhi ji's quote can do so write it down gandhi ji what, what what did he say he said that one should always one should always one should always keep one should always keep the windows of his house open but the doors closed but the doors closed so that one should let the winds from entire world this is metaphorical winds here means ideas winds from entire world come to my house but they should not blew me off my feet blew me off my feet theek hai ji they should not blew me off my feet chalo done with the three debates now let's move on to the preamble of the indian constitution and let's begin our discussion on preamble so <clears throat> in preamble the first thing you should know that what is a preamble basically the logic behind preamble or if you talk about what was the history of preamble so we inculcated preamble it is usually said from us constitution but what actually happened was we inculcated the preamble from the preamble to the un charter that was adopted in 1945 and coincidentally the preamble of the un charter which was adopted in 1945 was adopted from the united states of america's constitution hence we say this that our constitution has a uh, preamble has a source from american constitution moreover if we talk about the american constitution so american constitution was the first written constitution of the world formed in 19, uh, 1776 and back then it was the time when no other country in the world has the constitution for itself also the united states of america when they had a written constitution for themselves they also uh, sort of attached an introduction kind of thing or a summary kind of thing to their constitution and they named it preamble as well so this is the historical aspect of the preamble theek okay. hai so note it down in your own words the historical aspect right secondly if we talk about the logic of preamble so logic of inculcating preamble is basically what happens is if i gave you right now the any article of the constitution all you won't be able to interpret the exact meaning out of it the reason being the law always is written by legal luminaries and law always have a technical language so hence for the common man to understand what is there in the constitution the preamble is attached to the constitution to give some sense to it ठीक है जी सो राइट डाउन द डेफिनेशन प्रियम्बल कैन बी एन इंट्रोडक्शन प्रियम्बल इज अ इंट्रोडक्शन टू एनी लॉ और स्टैच्यूट सेकेंड वन मोर आस्पेक्ट दैट दिस इज आज एट प्रियम्बल विल बी ओनली टू द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन नहीं सर प्रियम्बल कैन बी टू एनी लॉ एनी स्टैच्यूट और लॉ फॉर इट इजी सिंप्लीफाइड वर्जन ऑफ गेटिंग अ समरी आउट ऑफ इट एनी टू एनी लॉ एंड स्टैच्यूट द प्रियम्बल कैन बी अटैच फुल स्टॉप नेक्स्ट आस्पेक्ट यू शुड अंडरस्टैंड दैट इज इट नेसेसरी part of law the answer is no sir theek hai and if it is not a necessary part of the law if it is attached to it it will not impact the status of the law and in future if it was attached and in future it is removed it will still not impact the status of the law theek hai ji then <clears throat> write down write down the line it is attached to law it is attached to law slash constitution as a preface or introduction the question is with respect to what is the logic of inculcating a preamble or and what is its importance importance part we are dealing logic likh lijiye attached to law as a preface or introduction attached to law or constitution as a preface or introduction 
because law is written because law is written in a technical form law is written in a technical form and hence and hence it may not be possible for a reader it may not be possible for a reader to make sense of the provisions to make sense of the provisions hence it is attached hence it is attached to explain the aim and purpose of the law to explain the aim and purpose of the law importance may the first point as it is you can inculcate whatever was the logic of having a preamble that if the question specifically evolves around the importance of preamble that can be your first importance second importance it it tells us about the nature of indian state that india will be a sovereign socialist secular democratic and a republic when you can mention the keywords third thing it clarifies or mentions the authority that is we the people and now just have a appreciation of this fact that we are not writing this as it is we the people is representing the uh, source of authority no this has to be seen with respect to the past debates we have done that was uh, was it was it the will of the people yes this word we the people is a testament that constitution is a will of the people constitution of india is a will of the people so that is also signified by the preamble it is again another importance of preamble theek hai ji then sir if we talk about then the common keywords serves as an introduction serves as a summary id card according to palki wala this and that whatever common points you will find in all the books you can quote them there then sir next aspect is it defines the ideals of indian state that india will have an ideal of having equality dignity fraternity liberty all those things can be quoted here it defines ideals then the next most important point of with respect to preamble is that if we read the preamble with respect to the other provisions for an example this idea of equal pay for equal work was derived by supreme court of india reading the provisions of preamble along with article 14 article 16 and that of ds uh, dpsp and thus it derived on the conclusion that yes by the support of preamble article 14 and article 16 and dpsp article 39 we can have equal pay for equal work in india theek okay, hai so write it down supreme court in randhir singh versus union of india case 1982 held that relying on preamble relying on preamble article 14 article 16 and along with article 39 of dpsp article 39 of dpsp right of equal pay right of equal pay for equal work right for equal pay for equal work can be given to men and women can be given to men and women and lastly if we talk about keshav nand bharti case in that supreme court said that preamble can act as a guiding light that means it helps the importance of preamble is that it helps to interpret the constitution in case the uh, the supreme court or the judiciary is having contradiction in two provisions 
सो दिस इज ऑल द इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ द वर्ड प्रियम्बल ठीक है जी ऑफ इनकलकेटिंग द प्रियम्बल लेट्स मूव टू द फर्स्ट डिबेट दैट इज प्रियम्बल पार्ट ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन और नॉट दैट इज प्रियम्बल द पार्ट ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन और नॉट चलो टू टेकल दिस डिबेट राइट डाउन द फर्स्ट केस एंड दैट इज योर बेरूबारी वर्सेज यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया केस नाइनटीन सिक्सटी बेरूबारी वर्सेज यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया केस नाइनटीन सिक्सटी and for your knowledge it was a presidential reference case so whenever you want to quote berubari versus union of case you can just uh, have a addition that it was a presidential reference case under article 143 of the constitution so in this the supreme court needed to decide we'll not go into the long history of the debate what 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 it was how did the things evolved up because that is a part of foundation and all here i assume that you all know but the stance of supreme court was that no it is not a part and the reason supreme court cited was that we inculcated the preamble from the constitution of united states of america and in usa it is not a part and hence we will also go with this narrative that it will not be a part in india it will not be a part in india theek hai ji chalo right on next case the evolution second case was your keshavanand bharti case of 1973 sir केशव नंद भारती केस ऑफ 1973. इन दिस व्हाट हैपन सुप्रीम कोर्ट बेसिकली ओवर रूल्ड द जजमेंट इन बेरूबारी वर्सेस यूनियन ऑफ इंडिया केस एंड सेट दैट इट इज अ पार्ट इट इज एन इंटेग्रल पार्ट इट कंटेन्स द बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर एज वेल इट कंटेन्स द बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर एज वेल ऑल्सो यू वन ऑफ द इंपॉर्टेंस यू कैन ऑल्सो राइट दैट प्रियम्बल कंटेन्स द बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर सर According to Keshav Nand Bharti case, preamble also contains the basic structure. Preamble is a basic structure. The answer is no. But preamble contains the basic structure. Highlight on the word contain. ठीक है तो ये देख लेना. चलो. So what was the logic? They said that, or they admitted the mistake that in Birubari versus Union of India case, we missed a very important fact. And what was that fact? The fact was, as we discussed in the previous debates, that. whatever provision was inculcated into the indian constitution by the constituent assembly of india was adopted after thorough deliberation and a consensus and supreme court said that we uh, we missed a very important fact that preamble was inculcated into the constitution of india by the motion of constituent assembly that it will be a part theek hai to constituent assembly when it inculcated it inculcated it by a motion that it will be a part of the constitution and hence we are now declaring it a part integral part and also contains the basic structure theek hai so it overruled berubari versus union of india case and said that not only but it is also part and further to in lic versus union of india case also said it is an integral part and in this uh, keshavanand bharti only it said it also contains the basic structure reason it said because they missed the fact because constituent assembly inculcated the preamble with a very motion that it is going to be a part of the constitution theek hai ji so this is the debate with respect to the preamble of the constitution let's move to the next debate that is with respect to the amendability aspect so when we say amendability aspect this case basically has its origin because in keshavanand bharti case the supreme court has already accepted that constitution that preamble is a part of the constitution the next thing arose that if preamble is a part of the constitution and the constitution can be amended can we amend the preamble as well so this debate arose in keshavanand bharti case keshavanand bharti case 1973 that you have accepted it as a part but if it is a part of the constitution itself can we amend preamble also so the argument of the side which was saying that no you cannot 
There were two sides. One was like, no, you cannot. Another was, yes, you can. Side which was saying the cannot, because again, I am emphasizing the constitution is very technical. Why? Because the provisions which enable us to amend the constitution of India are mentioned under Article 368. And now only if you open your Bayer Act and look at the Article 368 of the constitution, it gives the power to the parliament to amend the constitution, no doubt in that. But amend what of constitution? It gives the power to amend the provisions of the constitution. Amend the provisions of the constitution. But you have to accept it that it is a part of the constitution. So 368 is giving power to amend the provisions. It is a part. How can you do that? So here Supreme Court said that even if it is not a provision, and it is a part yet it can be amended yet it can be amended so this was the stance of the supreme court even though if it is not a part yet it can be even though it is not a provision yet it can be amended so sabne pucha supreme court ji what is the reason behind it so Supreme Court here, the word which should be there if the debate on amendability comes, used the doctrine of colorable legislation. So all these doctrines, doctrine of harmonious construction, variability, doctrine of reading down this and that, we'll be doing well, well, uh, once we reach fundamental rights. The so doctrine of creative interpretation. So Supreme Court used the doctrine of creative interpretation. Now, what was creative in this interpretation of the Supreme Court? Supreme Court said that, okay, what happens is we took the uh, preamble from USA. So it said there are two situations. One is the situation in US and another is the situation in India. So in USA, it said what happens is, USA may preamble walks before the constitution. So the metaphorical words that the Supreme Court used that preamble in USA walks before the constitution. Right. While if we talk about the Indian context here, the preamble walks along with the constitution or hand in hands of the constitution. Saath mein chalta hai, haath pakad ke chalta hai. It walks along or hand in hands with the constitution. So this is the way. This is one part of the argument. Another argument Supreme Court gave to justify this was, we'll be coming, we'll be relating the second argument with first, but equation, uh, equation one, equation two, maths type. Okay? This was equation one. Equation two, Supreme Court said that now, if preamble in India has to walk along with the constitution or walk in hands in hand with the constitution. This was the real intention. Now, if two things are there and they need to walk in hands in hand of the constitution, this was their intention. Now, to adjust in accordance with the time and exigencies of the future generations, Constituent Assembly clearly said that the constitution can be amended under Article 368. So, dono mein who have to walk in hands in hand, one can be amended. But if one can be amended and both have to walk in hands and hand with each other, don't you think that the constituent assembly makers also would have wanted to make preamble also amendable? Because tabhi they both can work in congruency, walk, they can both walk in hands in hand. Or let's imagine both have to walk on the speed of 2 km per second. Now, constitution speed can be tweaked. Don't you think that in order to make them both uh, go hand in hand, the speed of the preamble has also to be tweaked? So equating these two situations, right? Supreme Court said that the preamble can be amended even if it is not a part. Second argument it gave was that to maintain the congruency, Constituent Assembly people added the preamble to the constitution once the entire constitution was made so that it remains congruent. Constitution was made. Then at the last preamble was attached so that the congruency maintained. Now if the congruency has to maintain, do you think, don't you think that if the constitution is changing and they wanted preamble to be in tone with the constitution, the preamble also needs to be amended in tone with the constitution. 
Hence, this was the logical argument of Supreme Court, and it said in Keshavan Bharati case, the preamble, though it is not a part of the Constitution, yet it can be amended. Though it is not a provision of the Constitution, a part, but yet it can be amended. Chalo. Last debate we have. is with respect to that will the preamble help in aid to interpretation of the constitution so right right in the questions in which this can be asked right how important or to what extent to what extent preamble is important in the interpretation of the constitution to what extent preamble is important in the interpretation of the constitution Second, should constitution should constitution be interpreted in the light of preamble? Should constitution and the third aspect is can be can preamble can preamble be a source of power be a source of power? of anything which is not given explicitly which is not given explicitly and it can become the source it can become the source to take away the power to take away the power which has been given explicitly ji chalo so the first judgment with this regard we have is the A.K. Gopalan case. A.K. Gopalan case. So to uh, know the little background of this case, what happened was A.K. Gopalan was a communist leader and he was a political opponent of Nehru, right? So Nehru, just after independence, brought this preventive detention law, and A.K. Gopalan wanted to challenge it on the basis of the word liberal or liberty, which is mentioned in the preamble. He said preamble says that there should be liberty. But you are bringing preventive detention law. So on this basis, the Supreme Court has to judge what is correct and not. And Supreme Court has to see that whether the constitution should be interpreted in the light uh, of the preamble or not. So in this A.K. Gopalan case, the judiciary, see, judiciary has been evolving to something positive. Evolution hota rahe. Pehle it was not a kind of activist to judiciary or what. Theek hai. So in A.K. Gopalan case, sorry, it said that the constitution should not be interpreted in the light of preamble so it said that constitution should not be interpreted and it also said that preamble is not a guiding star preamble is not a guiding star but it gave a very uh, confusing statement that in case you have any contradiction or a vague statement contradiction preamble can be used to understand the mind of the constituent assembly preamble can be used to understand the mind of the cons constituent assembly so this was the approach second case with respect to this is berubari versus Union of India that was a presidential reference case under article 143 in the year 1960 in the year 1960 in this they said that preamble now the, the approach changed with respect to area interpretation they said that preamble is a key to open the mind of the constituent assembly people and they on, on, on the basis of this Birubari act only a prelims question of 2017 was based okay so noted down it said that the preamble is the key to open the mind of the constituent assembly preamble is a key to open the mind of the constituent assembly but the stance of the supreme court was it will be only this key will only be used whenever there are two contradictory provisions now what do you mean by this let's say the word 
liberty is mentioned now liberty can have so wide connotations around it you cannot demand anything in this country citing that word liberty is written in the preamble so i want it the word liberty from the preamble will be used in aiding in interpreting the constitution but only when there are two contradictory provisions supporting that what does it means let's say fundamental rights are the ones which are giving you the freedom of speech and expression on the other hand somewhere in the constitution it is written that the government can have uh, the provisions of sedition and all okay the government can impose sedition and according to ipc and all let's say now there are two contradictory provisions in this situation which one to go with the judiciary is in doubt hence what is written in preamble can be followed if preamble says liberty then on the basis of citing preamble you can say that the right to freedom of speech and expression would be weighted heavier than that theek hai ji so you can use but only when there are two contradictory provisions not you are taking anything citing liberty for that and that will be given chalo the third case with respect to this is your keshav nand bharti judgment and that was in the month of april 1973 so is made said that write it down it is a integral part it is an integral part or just write just a part it is a part comma it contains basic structure part bole hai basic structure bole hai it contains the noble vision of the constituent assembly people yes that also noble vision but but there was this statement that if we talk that preamble will be aiding in interpretation that is right but again they said that only interpreting the constitution when two contradictory provisions are given and hence to bring more clarity on this they added two statements that it will help in aiding the constitution help the judiciary to interpret the constitution only when there are two contradictory provisions but still in no case preamble can become a source of power which is not explicitly given in the constitution and it also cannot become the source to take away power which is explicitly given theek hai to on its own it cannot do if there are two contradictory provisions for the reference of whom preamble can be referred the answer is yes it can help in the aid and interpreting the constitution of india but still it is not the source but still it is not the source so these were our three debates with respect to preamble i guess we the positive time uh, the next two debates we will be continuing in the next class so we next class will be starting with the debate of uh, uh, the word sovereign and socialism right then we'll be moving to the another aspects like constitutionalism constitutional morality what is rule of law what is the importance of rule of law right how can the constitutional morality help counter the majoritarianism in the society so all these aspects will be the topic of our next class so for this class uh, i thank you uh, very much for staying and bearing me for around 2 to 1 1/2 hours whatever the time is it it is and please keep on revising the stuff ha na whatever we are referring in the class please uh, pick out the questions from previous year uh, and please write it please keep on writing the questions just uh, or i would suggest that previous year questions ko if you want to do it do not write it as it is theek hai previous year questions ka kitab leke aao for an example if there is a previous year question with respect to kuch bhi laga lijiye theek hai so us pe upar brainstorming karo think uh, think on it for 10 to 15 minutes just think even if you don't have the data to create it that's fine but create silos in your mind for an example if there was a question that uh was constituent assembly representative of indians or not so you have to think that okay this is the question now what i have to do is first thing i need an introduction in introduction what can be there okay so this data can be there i can start with the introduction of the constitution or the date of the constituent assembly so this this is some some sort of this would be there the data for which i will be cramming no problem in that then sir then i have to write the arguments that yes or no it was not a representative assembly why it was not remember the points from history which you are able to remember theek hai ji ek party dominance wala il point i'll give elections wala point i'll give churchill ne jo bola tha wo main de dunga then my next part should be to show the opposite side that yes it was 
ठीक है उसमें वॉट आई विल गिव आई 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 टेल दिस ब्यूटीफुल स्टेटमेंट दैट और वन योर ब्यूटीफुल आस्पेक्ट विच वी मिस आई जस्ट रिमेंबर सडनली देखो दिस इज आउट थिंकिंग हेल्प यू दैट इफ वी से दैट इंडियंस वर नॉट इलेक्टेड है ना बाई डायरेक्ट इलेक्शन और समथिंग द रीजन बिहाइंड सपोर्टिंग दैट आर्ग्यूमेंट वॉज दैट the constitution or the time in which the indian constitution or under, under the constituent assembly of india was built was not the right time to conduct a direct election sir because indian constitution or the india when it when it got independence when the constitution was getting framed there were riots and all happening that was the time of fear and trepidation and not of optimism and hence conducing or not, it was not a conducive time to conduct a direct elections at that point of time that can also be a beautiful point to counter that So, इस वजह से प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चन का ब्रेन स्टॉम्बिंग करो सो दैट नेक्स्ट टाइम वेन यू आर डूइंग द टॉपिक्स प्रोडिक्टिंग दैट वॉट कैन बी कम नेक्स्ट ईयर सो यू बी हंडी विद दैट एंड ऑल्सो यू बी एबल टू नो दैट वॉट ऑल वी हैव टू डू ठीक है जी सो ऑन दिस नोट लेट्स एंड क्लास एंड सी यू गाइज इन द नेक्स्ट क्लास थैंक यू सो मच